tonight on CBC Vancouver News. If you're watching this, please turn yourselves in. The hunt for two lower mainland men accused in a murder plot. Plus, really smelt diesel like oil, a lot of oil. The scramble to contain a fuel spill in a North Shore Creek and chutney one, chutney two, oh. and then somber. Helping devour a four foot dosa on our gastronomic tour of Surrey. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. We begin tonight with a Canada-wide manhunt. Two Lower Mainland men are on the run, and Vancouver police are asking for your help. CBC News at 11 host Dan Burrett joins us live now from Vancouver Police Headquarters. And Dan, both men face serious charges. What are they? Anita, Mike, take a good look at these two men because they are among four that are charged with conspiracy to commit murder. 22-year-old Moeen Khan of Surrey and 30-year-old Pashminder Boparai of Abbotsford are still on the loose and wanted, as you mentioned, across the country. They and two other men were charged as part of Task Force Tourniquet. It is a massive gang crime investigation that spans Metro Vancouver and now has links across the country. The two other men charged, Mustafa Ali and Nobin Malonga Masamba, are from Ottawa. Tourniquet has now led to more than 200 charges against 38 people. Officers say this is a mammoth effort. Not only are they fluid and able to cross boundaries to try and evade us, that the police are also fluid and we're able to respond to that and work together collaboratively to combat these types of issues. And again, very successful as far as I'm concerned as a team commander. Now, police, as part of Tourniquet, have seized 170 guns, kilos of fentanyl, heroin, meth, and coke, and more than $2 million in cash, jewels, and high-end luxury cars. Still, they're on the search for those two local men. Anyone who knows where they are is asked to call police or Crime Stoppers if you want to stay anonymous. You can see more of their photos on our website, cbc.ca slash bc, and we'll have the latest tonight at 11 o'clock on your late news. Mike, Anita. Dan Burrett live at Vancouver Police Headquarters tonight. Thank you. The province is hoping to have mandatory vaccination registrations by the time kids return to school in the fall. It's in response to the current measles outbreak in B.C. While Health Minister Adrian Dix says he's encouraged by an uptick in vaccinations, there are improvements that can be made, including the creation of an immunization registry. I want to be very methodical about this. Right now, the important thing, and, and we're, we, can, we can share this, is that people are immunizing their children and themselves. Now, you see a dramatic increase in the last couple of weeks around that. He adds they are working towards a September timeline to have mandatory registration in place at schools province-wide. 13 cases of measles have now been confirmed. While crews are scrambling to clean up a fuel spill in a North Vancouver Creek, the oily sheen first spotted on Friday. And as Joel Ballard reports, some feel more could have been done to prevent it from spreading. On this North Vancouver trail, a truck with a giant vacuum on top sits parked. It's being used in the district's efforts to clean up the salmon bearing water. Spills are a really big concern for the district. This is McKay Creek. It's one of our most important small watersheds. Bose says a fair bit of oil released onto the road trickled down the sewer grates. Anytime pollution, and it could be anything, oil that we're dealing with today or other kinds of pollution can really cause a negative effect to not just the fish, the aquatic life, but the wildlife that uses the corridors. That's why he says it's important to work together to keep things out of storm sewers. Storm water from the streets flow down the sewer drains and actually collect in a big basin underneath the ground here. And that basin feeds into McKay Creek. So what the district's done is they have these big vacuum trucks that suck up all that oily water, about 7,000 litres at a time, and take it off-site to be cleaned. You can see it all in these pools. This local environmentalist first noted the spill while walking down the trail. He thinks more should have been done to remove the oil that had already leaked into the creek. Along this whole creek from here to the ocean because we could have sopped up a lot with pads and oil pads. As someone who had dedicated many volunteer hours to maintaining this creek, he says it's frustrating. Yeah, no, we continue to see it throughout. our. We work from West Van right through North Van in a number of watersheds. This is not an uncommon event. 
Investigators have identified the source of the spill, but are not making it public until the work is complete. The bill for the taxpayers, though, is expected to be high. The total cost to district on this kind of a project could literally be in the tens of thousands of dollars. We, we don't know exactly until it's all finished and completed. So far, workers have sucked up seven truckloads of polluted water, roughly 49,000 litres. But it's unlikely they'll ever know how much has already passed through this vital habitat. Joel Ballard, CBC News, North Vancouver. Well, the B.C. government is moving to tighten up rules around payday loans. Changing consumer protection laws to prevent people from getting trapped in a cycle of debt. Provincial Affairs reporter Tanya Fletcher has more. British Columbians are believed to be among the largest users of payday loans in Canada. And for some CBC has heard from in the past, they're often a last resort. Bills come and paydays aren't big enough. For years, Charlie Stewart struggled to get ahead of his debt and was shocked by how much his loans wound up costing. Even when I was making the loan agreement, I was dumbfounded by some of the fees that they were adding on. It's like, I was wondering, can they do this? Are they allowed? At one point, he borrowed $500, but with high interest and extra fees, had to pay back $675 within a few weeks. Now the province is promising to do more to protect vulnerable people. It is a very widespread issue, uh, not just here in British Columbia, but in fact right across the country. Consumer Protection BC has been regulating the payday lending sector for almost a decade. Our data is showing that year over year, more British Columbians are borrowing more and more money from payday lenders, now approaching $400 million a year. Under the proposed changes, the new regulatory framework would ban certain fees and charges, set limits on the total cost of borrowing, and restrict the use of personal information. You're not allowed to offer an inducement, such as a, a magazine uh, subscription. You're not allowed to do uh, wage assignments, where you would agree to assign uh, some of your wages to, you know, to, to, pay, off, to pay off the loan. Um, you're not going to be able to, to give a, uh, another loan if there's another loan that's still uh, outstanding. He says payday loan companies have become more creative in offering loans that fall outside the scope of what's currently regulated, making it tough to enforce existing laws. So a payday loan is defined as, as, as one is under $1,500, um, and it's paid back over a set period of time. But what we have seen is now is the growth of, of installment, longer-term loans at a higher rate that fall out that. So they're not technically a payday loan. Uh, they are a different kind of, of, of loan. The government is also setting up a new consumer financial education fund. It's a move being applauded by advocates of BC's most vulnerable people. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Victoria. One person is in hospital in critical condition after a shooting in Chilliwack. The call came in shortly after 1 p.m. Police have blocked off the area around Victor Street and Bowl Avenue as they investigate. No word yet on whether the shooting is considered targeted and no indication of a motive. To the Okanagan now, where the Ministry of Transportation says it hopes to reopen Highway 97 early next week. A rock slide cut off the four-lane highway between Peachland and Summerland earlier this month, which is the main route between Kelowna and Penticton. A detour route is in place on the west side of Okanagan Lake. So far, crews have removed about 13,000 cubic meters of rocks and dirt from the site, which is only half of what came down off the slope. When we do open, uh, we do anticipate having the southbound lane, slow lane, close to traffic as well. Um, and that's just for, for cautionary purposes. It's been very cold since we've got going, and we want to see how the slide responds to some warmer temperatures and precip precipitation. Crews will continue to monitor the site once the highway reopens to make sure that slope remains safe. Well, Jagmeet Singh solidified his position as federal NDP leader with a by-election win in Burnaby last night. Despite finally winning a seat in the House of Commons, many political analysts say Singh has a lot of work to do to reach more Canadians. As Leanne Young reports tonight, it's going to be an uphill climb. Oh my goodness! It was gratitude and likely relief from Jagmeet Singh. Thank you, thank you, thank you. As he stepped up to the mic for his victory speech. The win was crucial for Singh. For 16 months as federal NDP leader, he's been without a seat in the House of Commons with an ultimatum from his own party, win or find a new job. 
But despite last night's victory, political watchers say the bigger challenge is still ahead during this fall's federal election. Remember, uh, it was the Liberals in 2015 who took British Columbia by storm. So uh, seeing uh, whether or not Singh can use Burnaby as something of a, a launching pad to make inroads into uh, Burnaby South and as well as uh, Metro Vancouver and finally all of British Columbia. So it was probably no surprise that even though the dancing went late last night, Singh was back on the campaign trail bright and early. They want to see us do more to invest in a green economy where we create great jobs and also reduce our emissions. You're, you are still in campaign mode. We're always fighting for people. There's a nonstop, there's a nonstop uh, rule that we are always going to fight for people. His job now is to build support for his party across the country. So where does that leave his constituents? I think it's definitely a good thing when, for any running to have a national party leader because you get more attention. This former NDP strategist says Singh will put Burnaby South on the political map. Whether it's uh, in opposition or the prime minister, you're going to get a lot more attention than a backbench little-known MLA or MP. Of those eligible to vote, 30% turned out, the number typically expected in a by-election, and of those, 39% voted for Singh. On the streets of Burnaby today, housing was the key issue for most people, but they also had their reservations, even if they did vote for him. What I want him to do is just be honest. I think he's still new. He, he also has his flaws, I guess. He hasn't, hasn't had a seat before, so aside from provincially in Ontario, so it'll it's yet to be seen. Singh has said housing and medical care will be his focus as he looks to make his mark in October's election. Leanne Young, CBC News, Vancouver. Vancouver police are going to be helping Surrey develop its own police department. The two cities signing an agreement as Surrey looks to replace the RCMP with a municipal force. It's kind of looking at what would the structure of the department look like, uh, any other advice at that level that, that the city would want, uh, and uh, we'll see how it moves forward. So this is an initial agreement, and I could see more coming back to council if, if this one works out. Vancouver will provide technical assistance to Surrey as it develops a transition plan. Surrey Mayor Doug McCallum says this is a good opportunity to learn best practices from an internationally recognized police force. A murder suspect has been arrested in Langley, but another man wanted in the same case is still on the loose. Hugh Alexander McIntosh was taken into custody without any issues. However, Kamloops RCMP are still searching for Gordy Bratton. They're both suspects in the murder of Jason Glover. Bratton's considered to be armed and dangerous. You're asked to call police immediately if you have any information about where he is. A public inquiry into money laundering has officially been requested by the Green Party. The time is now. It is not to wait down the road. The time is now. These things take a long time. They are costly. And the sooner we get a move on on it, the better we are to getting and close, the quicker we are to getting resolutions. Leader Andrew Weaver says the money laundering scandal has contributed to the crisis around housing affordability and the opioid epidemic. This echoes a call from Vancouver and other cities around the Lower Mainland. The NDP has said it will wait until the second money laundering report is released next month before making any decisions. Well, New Westminster could become the first school district in the province to supply free feminine hygiene products in its restrooms. The school board is voting on a motion tonight to install coin-free dispensers for pads and tampons in all girls and universal washrooms starting in September. Many elementary and secondary schools currently have dispensers, but they usually charge students to access the products. A parent raised the issue with the school board back in January. It's a gender equity issue uh, at its root. For, for girls and women, uh, we've, uh, we've treated uh, their periods as something that's not a basic need, and uh, it's time we uh, address that. The board says it'll also work with the other 60 school districts across BC to encourage them to supply free products to their students as well. Very hard to complain these days with the beautiful no sunshine we've been here. getting. Yes. <laughs> and Johanna Wagstaff is here to tell us if it's going to stick around. I think everybody's hoping so. Yes, I like uh, how Mike added the yet on just to, <laughs> you know, buffer any forecast uh, that might come up. We do have a little bit of a midweek blip tomorrow, but otherwise 
cold and sunny is what we've got for the uh, long range. I just want to show you a quick look at the temperatures across the country tonight. Minus 9 and through Kelowna. Getting a bit of relief in through Alberta, who is in the extreme cold alert uh, warnings for the better part of uh, the past three days. That Arctic air, though, is going to move back down across Alberta and Saskatchewan tomorrow and still dealing with blowing snow uh, in through the eastern half of the country. We still have our wind warnings for Howe Sound. Those outflow winds will kick in once again overnight tonight and tomorrow morning. And Vancouver Island, the east side, really feeling those winds earlier this morning. We even had a bit of a brisk wind, uh, more brisk than yesterday. A slightly different angle meant that Metro Vancouver did feel a bit of a wind chill this morning if you were uh, out early. So same story again tomorrow with high pressure in place. Then we start to see this system from the south sneaking into our forecast zone. It'll look a little something like this. Uh, generally increasing clouds through the first half of the day. I think any precip, though, will hang off until the second half. I'll tell you more about what we'll expect, but I don't see huge accumulations coming up. Okay, thanks, Joe. You're welcome. This weather update is brought to you by your local REMAX agent. The experience, the tools, the know-how. That's the sign of a REMAX agent. to the drawing board for the District of North Vancouver over a plot of land it's been trying to develop for more than three years. Council has voted to restart consultations on a property that was supposed to hold a five-story building for affordable rentals. Justin McElroy reports. This is the Delbrook lands. Just a few blocks from City Hall, the plan was for a ground-level respite care facility and four stories of non-profit rental housing. Now, the previous plans had been in works for over three years with plenty of consultation, planning, meetings, and votes. But the final vote had to be approved by a new council, a new mayor, and they had new priorities. So we didn't uh, focus on the immediate neighbors to the site as much as we probably could have. And the process actually had gotten so far advanced that uh, we weren't able to sort of go back and talk about what the neighbors would, would be interested on the site in anymore at that point. After outcries from residents and suburban communities about several planned developments, Mike Little cruised to victory on a campaign of slowing growth. And this new consultation explicitly prioritizes the voice of the Delbrook Community Association. There are some voices that we just don't think were, were considered to the level that they should be. One of the two councillors that wanted the project to go ahead understands there's a political element at play. If you look at the uh, election campaigns uh, that our council ran on, um, that was largely a, a theme, um, just slowing down development uh, across the region. But he hopes the new plan doesn't throw away all of the work and ideas that were in the old plan. It's not necessarily about like learning new things this time around. It's about a process where everyone's on board with how that's disseminated and come up with. Absolutely. I think people just want to feel heard. And um, by going through this again, and I think particularly by including the whole park site, um, we're going to have a, a broader discussion. Um, but I think we really have to recognize all of the feedback that we have already heard thus far. And, um, and hopefully we will as we go into this process again. And the district isn't alone in this approach. In the city of Vancouver, a new citywide plan is beginning soon where local neighborhoods will have a greater say in theory over what goes or doesn't go in their communities. Call it solid grassroots politics or rejecting regional planning, but it's another sign that in politics, as in life, some residents will matter more than others. Justin McElroy, CBC News, District of North Vancouver. And Justin's series is available for you to watch online anytime. Visit us on YouTube, where you can catch up on each part of Metro Matters on the road. Some good episodes in there. And if you are watching on television, remember you can also watch this show streaming live and on demand. You can find us on Facebook or YouTube by searching CBC Vancouver or watch on our website, cbc.ca slash bc. A shocking incident in Quebec has called new attention to the problem of racism in Canadian hockey. Coming up, why a black player left the game midway through. Well, a major move has been made by British Prime Minister Theresa May in order to get her Brexit deal approved. She is handing control to MPs. Comes with the threat of a revolt by ministers who want to stay in the European Union. 
Kayla Hounsell has more on today's developments from London. Today, Theresa May told MPs they will get another chance to vote on the withdrawal agreement she negotiated with the European Union by March 12th. Remember, this is the deal overwhelmingly rejected in January. And since then, Theresa May has been trying to get the EU to agree to changes, but the EU has been resistant to reopening the withdrawal agreement. So if MPs vote down the deal again, the next day they'll be asked whether they would support leaving the European Union with no deal. Experts have warned this could cause chaos and disruption to things like manufacturing, supplies of medicine and food prices. So if all of that is rejected, then MPs will be asked to vote on whether they would like to extend Article 50. That's the mechanism through which the UK is leaving the EU and that would delay Brexit. Let me be clear. I do not want to see Article 50 extended. Our absolute focus should be on working to get a deal and leaving on the 29th of March. These options are being presented today after three of Theresa May's ministers gave her an ultimatum. Agree to delay Brexit if no deal can be approved or we'll quit. Meanwhile, opposition Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn now says his party will support a second referendum. He wants to put it back to the people and ask them whether they want Theresa May's deal or whether they now want to remain in the European Union. Britain is due to leave the EU in just one month. Kayla Hounsell, CBC News, London. Well, nine years ago, a 7.0 magnitude earthquake shook, then crumbled Haiti. We need the whole world to see what happened here. Haiti is broken now. The number of people killed estimated to be more than 300,000, while displacing, displacing more than a million. And through that time, our Paul Hunter was there. This was a five-story building collapsed down to this. The white car at the bottom of this, United Nations, obviously. What people don't know, even all this time after the earthquake, whether there's anybody alive in there. It's the most precious commodity around, water. When this truck pulled up, people started streaming toward it from all directions, this side and the other side. Now, Paul was on the ground as the country tried to rebuild, and now, nine years later, he is there as Haiti is being rocked by riots triggered by allegations of corruption in a flailing economy. So what exactly has changed and what hasn't in that time? Well, join us later on our YouTube live stream when Paul will have more from Port-au-Prince. In the meantime, we'll have more on what's making headlines elsewhere in Canada in just a few moments. Actions of fans at a semi-professional hockey game in Quebec are being met with outrage and disgust. The fans hurled racist comments and insults at one of the players, then turned on his family and girlfriend who were in the stands. The whole incident was caught on camera. The CBC's Allison Northcott has more. I had to put my jersey over my face because I was like, I had, I was like, I had teardrops, you know. Jonathan Diaby says he's faced racism before, but nothing like this. He started yelling racist stuff at my parents and my sister and all that, and myself. Good old Negro and all that, the baboons, like a bunch of stuff that was said. The insults, he says, came from a handful of spectators and were so bad he and his family left the arena before the game was over. Well, my dad uh, was told to go back home, that he had no business uh, in his country and all the places and stuff like that. You know, People were like uh, touching his hair, they were making fun of him. My sister was scared, my girlfriend was scared. He says referees and security guards did nothing to protect them. <laughs> Diaby's league, the Ligue Nord-Américaine de Hockey, is notorious for rough play and rowdy crowds. But Diaby's coach says even by that standard, this goes too far. In 2019, it's something that, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't see anymore. And it's, uh, I think it's disgusting. The head of the league apologized to Diaby in this video, telling fans that racist, sexist or homophobic comments are unacceptable. An owner of the opposing team says security guards did act, but didn't kick anyone out because no one threw any punches. Now, Robert Chevrier says the team is trying to identify the fans in question to ban them from future games. 
Former NHL player Georges Larac says there should be a rule across the league requiring teams to kick fans out who engage in this kind of behavior. This is worse than worst thing that I've ever seen. When I started to play hockey and, I, and I've lived some racism when I played hockey, it was never to that level. This is not hockey, you know, like that's a that's far beyond like uh, what should be happening in, in, on a regular Saturday night. You know, nobody should be feel threatened to go watch his son play a hockey game. Diaby says it's also up to players to tell their fans that hate is not okay in the stands or anywhere else. Allison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Omar Cotter was back in court today asking an Edmonton judge to declare an end to his eight-year sentence, even though he served less than half of that time. That's because his sentence is on hold pending the outcome of a legal proceeding in the U.S. And as Rafi Bujakanian explains, that case doesn't look like it will wrap up anytime soon. For years, Omar Khadr's legal team has been fighting to reduce the terms of his sentence. In May 2015, they got him out on bail with conditions. But that means he still has nearly half his sentence left to serve while he tries to appeal the conviction that landed him in jail in the first place. Well, Mr. Khadr's sentence has been frozen in time for about three and a half years now. And uh, essentially, we just want the clock to at least start ticking again. Uh, because the fact is that the uh, appeal in the U.S. appears to have no end in sight. So we want Mr. Cotter's sentence to start ticking so that it will eventually end. Whitling says Cotter's bail time should count toward his sentence, but the Crown says it's more complicated than that. It was a U.S. military court that ordered Cotter serve eight years in jail for throwing a grenade that killed an American soldier in Afghanistan in 2002. And Canadian federal prosecutors say Canada has international obligations to ensure that Cotter serves that full sentence. Meanwhile, his American lawyer is trying to appeal that conviction but says there is a delay there. Justice delayed is justice denied. That's a truism because it's true. And uh, he's entitled at least to a decision. An Alberta judge is expected to rule on Cotter's ask to end his sentence in about a month. Rafi Bujikani, CBC News, Edmonton. What will she say? And what will the political fallout be? Tomorrow, Vancouver MP Jody Wilson-Raybould will get to, in her words, speak her truth on the SNC Lavana affair. That story coming up.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Not only are they fluid and able to cross boundaries to try and evade us, that the police are also fluid and we're able to respond to that. The hunt is on for two Lower Mainland men accused in connection with plotting someone's death. 22-year-old Moeen Khan and 30-year-old Pushminder Jason Boparai are charged with conspiracy to commit murder. If you have any information about where they are, you are asked to call police. This is a common occurrence. It's a regular occurrence. It's been going on in this watershed, we know, for over 40 years. Crews are scrambling to clean up a fuel spill in a North Vancouver Creek. The oily sheen was first spotted Friday. Environmental groups are criticizing the district, saying it should have been cleaned up faster. The Vancouver MP at the center of a political firestorm in Ottawa will get to, in her words, speak her truth. Jody Wilson-Raybould testifies tomorrow afternoon to a Commons Justice Committee on the SNC-Lavalin controversy. The CBC's David Cochran reports from Ottawa. It's uh, important that uh, people get an opportunity to testify. The Prime Minister says she can speak freely. As we said, uh, waiving privilege, uh, waiving cabinet confidentiality is something that uh, we had to take very seriously, but I'm pleased that... Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, wilson Wiggle is going to be able to share her perspective. And the Liberals almost seem relieved. It's just important that, uh, that, that she speak and that they're, all of the, the mystery uh, is, goes. This is uh, important for all of us to get on with our work. The truth will come out and uh, Canadians can judge as to exactly what happened. Her testimony will be the most significant event in this story since the Globe and Mail first reported that she was pressured to intervene in the SNC-Lavalin file. To this point, only Canada's top civil servant has given an expansive, on-the-record account of what happened, insisting the government did nothing wrong in speaking to the former Attorney General. So I can tell you with complete assurance that my view of those conversations is that they were within the boundaries of what's lawful and appropriate. Through it all, Wilson Raybould stayed silent. Privilege and confidentiality are not mine to waive, and I hope that I have the opportunity to speak my truth. So last night, a cabinet order waiving cabinet confidence and solicitor client privilege to allow Wilson Raybould to speak that truth. This morning, the Justice Committee agreed to her request for a 30-minute opening statement. I think, uh, just like all Canadians and all committee members, we're pleased to uh, hear uh, her, uh, her take on things. With that, the speculation shifts from will she be able to speak to what will she finally say. I think, her, obviously, her testimony is pivotal. I want to know um, what was it that caused her to lose confidence in her cabinet solidarity and resign? Because that's a big step. Look, I, I, uh, I heard what Jody said uh, earlier in the cabinet room, and I certainly heard what the clerk said at, at the committee. And my view is that, uh, that, you know, nothing has been done that's untoward in this case. It's entirely appropriate, but Jody gets a chance to say her piece, and that's entirely appropriate too. CBC's David Cochran reporting from Ottawa tonight. Now, late this afternoon, Wilson Raybould sent a letter to the Justice Committee saying her appearance tomorrow is a step in the right direction, but falls short of what is required. She says the cabinet order only applies to her time as Attorney General and does nothing to release her from restrictions imposed on her as Minister of Veterans Affairs. CBC News Network will have special live coverage of her testimony tomorrow. It all starts at noon Pacific time. And at 6.33 on this Tuesday evening, you are looking at a live shot into Burnaby. Gorgeous tonight, another sunny day, but it was quite chilly. The risk of snow flurries is still in the forecast. How likely is it to happen? Well, Johanna has the full forecast next.
This weather update is brought to you by Remax. What's your home worth? Find out with our instant valuation tool at Remax.ca. Yeah, I think that's as pretty close to a 10 as you get here on the South Coast, don't you think? Today? I'd almost call it an 11. I oh, would almost, well, okay. This one goes to 11, yeah. <laughs> It's off the charts. Making our own scale. Off the charts. It's Beautiful. true. Yeah, stunning day out there today. Uh, we've got one more dry morning, but yes, I am tracking a bit of a midweek blip. Let's take you through that stunning start, though. If you weren't up early to enjoy it, looked a little something like this. I promise we didn't repeat yesterday's time lapse, but it was a repeat of a day. Not a cloud in the sky. A little gustier out there, so it felt a little cooler but just a stunner, especially if you were uh, bundled up. And it did almost feel warm in the sun. And that is some hope to look forward to. We are gaining roughly this week about three minutes of daylight every day. And as we move into a March sun, the sun angle will uh, uh, increase and we are bound to warm up eventually, even if I don't see it in the five to seven day forecast. Uh, we are looking at uh, chilly temperatures right across the country, as I mentioned earlier, still under the wind warning in through Howe Sound. Uh, taking a look at the current temperatures, one right now in through Westman, a two at YVR. So temperatures dropping as we start to get those outflow winds kicking in once again overnight tonight, already a zero out towards Nanaimo and Victoria at a three. So taking you through the overnight, watch for that increasing cloud, by 7 a.m. tomorrow, we'll still see some sunny breaks out there, I think, but clouds are on the move coming in from the south. I think the precip will hold off until the late afternoon, early evening hours at this point. And that's when temperatures will be above the freezing mark by a good three, four degrees. So for most of Metro Vancouver, this just means a few showers uh, for the evening commute. But the rain snow line is hanging on, I, I think around sort of 500 meters. So we may see some wet snow in through higher elevations of Metro Vancouver, North Shore, and we'll catch a few flurries out towards the valley too, right through to Thursday morning. So as far as accumulations go, I don't think we'll see anything major across Metro Vancouver. There is a chance some of those fat flakes might start sticking into our usual suspects of uh, Metro Vancouver, those higher elevations, but most of it will stay confined uh, towards the North Shore uh, where, uh, where we are looking to get a good 10 to, uh, 10 to 15 centimeters for our local mountains over the next uh, 24 hours. Uh, windy conditions, as I mentioned tonight, as those outflow winds kick in once again, high pressure has been dominating across the whole province. It's not just BC, all the way up to the Yukon and Northwest Territories enjoying this high pressure ridge, keeping it clear and cold, but again, windy uh, out towards coastal areas. This is the low pressure system that's sneaking in for tomorrow afternoon, and it's sort of a double-barreled low. So we'll get this dissipating low, bringing a, a few flakes or showers tomorrow afternoon, but the second center will push up into the Kootenays. Uh, we do have extreme cold alerts still in place for the Kootenays. Uh, a general two to five centimeters of snow uh, kicking off the Wednesday forecast across the south coast. Let me take you through the full week, though. Uh, we do have a cold outlook. Overnight lows don't rise above the freezing mark as far as I can see. Uh, you can see clearing skies for Thursday, a little bit of a warm up as we head into the weekend. Back to that gorgeous high pressure in through early next week. Once again, the model's trying to bring our temperatures up starting next Wednesday, Thursday. I'm going to have to see it in this sort of uh, day three, day four, day five forecast to put some confidence in it yet. Wow. Yeah, still too many minuses on that screen. Exactly. But like I said, <laughs> we got to get warmer as the sun gets And it's as we head into to March. It's bound, yes, <laughs> March on Saturday. Or right? else it's, you just go you're on right. spring break vacation. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Hey, thanks, Joe. You're welcome. This week, we are focusing in on one of Canada's fastest growing cities. Surrey's diverse demographics have helped foster a passionate food scene, one that connects customers to cultures from around the world. Lisa Christensen now with a conversation over delicious dosa. Here we are on the border of Surrey Delta, home of the best Indian food in all of Surrey. Surat, my friend here, is going to take us to her favorite place. Yes, we're at Sarvan Bhavan. Uh, it's a South Indian food place. I love South Indian. So, okay. These are rice. Mm -hmm. uh, we call them chawal. It, they mix all the spices. So even if you don't have anything to eat with the rice, it's just delicious. These are different kind of sambars they have. So I like this one because this is usually what you eat with dosa and everything. These are different kind of chutneys. 
chutneys are kind of sauce. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, whatever we have is just what we're going to eat with the dosa. Oh, we don't okay. have the main ah. thing yet. <laughs> so we're just going to eat this with the dosa. Good thing I like to eat. <laughs> South Indian and Tamil people are known to make the best dosa. So we are in the hands of pros, so that's good. Okay. So you have to roll it in the proper uh, right, yeah. thickness so that it doesn't that's get right. too thick or too yeah. thin. Yeah, I know. as thin as possible for people to get the... Oh, I see. Makes sense. Oh, so you need two people. To roll it properly. Oh, I see. That's a big one. That's a huge. Family paper dosa. Oh, family paper dosa. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen this. Wow. Right now. So this is basically bhatura. You eat it with the chana. You uh, we ate the one what spicy one. So we usually eat uh, this bread with the chanas, and it's a breakfast dish. I mean that's a very big uh, power breakfast. Oh. Wow! Oh my God! He made 850 chana bhatura one day of this size. Are you two gonna be able to eat that whole thing? Uh, well, you can help us, I think. <laughs> We will try. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> you put it somewhere on the plate. I mean, that's a lot of dosa. Chutney one, chutney two, oh. and then sambar. You triple dip. And then? OK. All right. Mm. That's so delicious. How important is food to Indian culture? Oh. Oh, so important. It's like, I cannot think, like there are, there are rituals where we fast. And there are rituals where we eat more. But it's always food related. Indian coffee is, is a bit different. So, especially the Madras coffee, you will see that the texture, the color is different and the way they make is that's the biggest difference. Wait, cheers. Cheers. <laughs> It's so good. Done. I didn't even save any for you, sorry. <laughs> Sarvana Bhavan is located on 120th Street, right on the border of Surrey and Delta. And though I can promise you you'll have a great meal, I can't promise you all a four-foot dosa. Thanks, Sarat. So we're all going for doses after, we're all going right? For doses after this, we yeah. could be out there in like what, half an hour? Yeah. We've got places yeah. nearby. We can go oh. here. Oh, oh, yeah. that's great. <laughs> so Lisa's uh, in Surrey uh, all week, checking out some of the restaurants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, she'll be bringing us another story tomorrow. The family behind the popular Afghan kitchen and their take on some Middle Eastern staples. That's going to be amazing. Yeah. Too. So basically, uh, start preparing your your stomachs for this time every night. You can watch it here or <laughs> online at uh, CBC's Facebook and YouTube pages. Well, the White House is calling him a disgraced felon tonight. Coming up, Donald Trump's former fixer prepares to testify in front of the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Join CBC Vancouver's Anita Bath as she hosts the 20th anniversary of the Influential Women in Business Awards on March 8th. And don't miss the Talking Stick Festival. Catch extraordinary performances and art featuring some of the best Indigenous artists Turtle Island has to offer. For more on these events, check out cbc.ca slash bc. Political bombshells will likely drop this week in Washington as Michael Cohen testifies in front of the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee. Donald Trump's former fixer is expected to tell Congress about Trump's Russian contacts. As well as his alleged criminal conduct since he became president. Keith Bogue has the details. First of all, I want to thank you all for sticking around and waiting for me. Michael Cohen spent 10 hours testifying privately to the Senate Intelligence Committee today. Tomorrow, he goes public. And I look forward to tomorrow, to being able to, in my voice, to tell the American people my story, and I'm going to let the American people decide exactly who's telling the truth. Apparently, his testimony today was compelling. I said it may be the most important thing I'm involved in in my public life in the Senate, and nothing I've heard today dissuades me from that view. How are you? Cohen once said he'd take a bullet for Donald Trump, but since his legal troubles began last year, He's been tossing Trump under the presidential limousine every chance he could. I should not be the only one taking responsibility. He's maybe best known for his role in secretly funneling hush money from Trump to two women who say they had affairs with him. But then he blew the cover on that story. He was trying to hide what you were doing, correct? Correct. And he knew it was wrong? Of course. Cohen will be asked about that in his testimony tomorrow and much more about his decade-long role as Trump's fixer. The American people deserve to know whether Donald Trump has been functioning as the president of the United States of America or as the equivalent of an organized crime boss. Michael Cohen can shed some light on that very important question. The White House was out with a statement early to discredit Cohen. Sarah Huckabee Sanders said it's laughable that anyone would take a convicted liar like Cohen at his word and pathetic to see him given yet another opportunity to spread his lies. Republican Congressman Matt Getz, a zealous Trump supporter, tweeted this afternoon, Hey, Michael Cohen, do your wife and father-in-law know about your girlfriends? Maybe tonight would be a good time for that chat. I wonder if she'll remain faithful when you're in prison. She's about to learn a lot. That's the CBC's Keith Bogue reporting from Washington. Now, while all of this is going down in the U.S. Capitol, Donald Trump is half a world away in Vietnam, preparing for his second sit-down meeting with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Trump and Kim will hold meetings in Hanoi tomorrow and Thursday. Summit comes eight months after their first meeting in Singapore. Kim arrived earlier today in his heavily armored train surrounded by bodyguards. The denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and ending sanctions against Pyongyang are expected to be the main talking points. The signs of recent riots that rocked Haiti are still visible on the streets of Port-au-Prince. Those protests triggered by allegations of corruption against the government amid a flailing economy. But as Paul Hunter reports, the Caribbean nation was already struggling to rebuild. Yeah, people have been asking us what it's like in Port-au-Prince today, nine years after uh, the earthquake. So we thought we'd take a break from the other news of the day in this city and try to dive in on that question. And here really is Exhibit A, what was the magnificent cathedral in central Port-au-Prince, destroyed by the quake of uh, 2010 and even today, nine years later, remains a shambles but even you know worse than that the symbolism of that is this this tent we met the fellow who lives inside that tent has lived there every day for the past nine years since the quake right the misery in this city nine years after the earthquake is evident at almost any corner in fact if you take a look down this street which to my memory it was a literal disaster zone after the quake just wreckage everywhere the, the rubble has been cleared up here, but the misery remains. We met a family who had almost finished rebuilding their house when those demonstrations that we've been talking about came by. It got out of control. The demonstrators set fire to the place. 
It's a wreck. They lost everything. We're victims again, they told me. Life in Haiti was hard before the earthquake. It was impossible afterward and to this day remains complicated. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Port-au-Prince. Uh, Gluten-free, paleo, vegan, keto, is that right? That's right. He's yeah. been asking me how to yes. pronounce it. <laughs> I didn't know. Uh, yeah, when it comes to food, Canadians are always looking for what's next. But there's one fad that likely isn't going anywhere anytime soon. The CBC's Chris Glover has more on how top chefs are infusing cannabis into their menus. Even if it's a bit bumpy sometimes. Did you order this? No, I did not. No, yeah, I think he's got the wrong table. Yes. <laughs> Chefs are always looking to the future for the next hot food trend. Everywhere we go, people want plant-based. Plant-based burgers are among the hottest foods right now, but in a survey by Restaurants Canada, weed-infused beverages and food are number one and two on the list of what's next. And the up-and-comers could be potentially the next hot trends at restaurants. Are people surprised to come into your area here and see yeah. robots and weed? Yeah, yes, 100% they are. I am surprised still. Chef Charlotte Langley curated the restaurant of the future for Restaurants Canada. By showcasing these recipes that are standardized recipes, and we're working with all of our cannabis partners, it's a really good starting point to start the education and the conversation of cannabis use in, at home. What do you think the top trends are for 2019? I'm sure cannabis is right up there. This Mississauga a couple is interested in possible experimentation with cannabis in their cheesecakes. We love this show. It's, it's like Disneyland for us. Um, and we uh, come here to do uh, some exploration. Toronto's Board of Health says don't explore cannabis in gummy bears and candies. Today, it accepted a recommendation to urge the federal government to ban certain edibles that appeal to kids. But some entrepreneurs aren't digesting the news well. And if you don't include all forms of edibles, then you're going to get into the problem where certain forms of edibles will just be on the black market. So it's kind of... Um, strengthening the black market in a way when really you want to have full product diversity. I'm nervous. I'm a parent, but I'm also a businessman, so I, I sit on the fence there of like, do I want this or do I not want this? The bald baker keeps his line of sweets on trend. Right now, that means vegan and gluten-free, but he's already practicing with pot. I think it all comes down to the packaging and the way you actually sell your product. If it's properly positioned as, you know, an adult edible, not a kid's edible, and I think it's fine. He says once the cannabis craze is over, Honest, there's a diabetes epidemic that people are starting to realize. Sugar reduction is the next up and coming trend he's watching. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. Coming up, why one NBA superstar should maybe stick to the hardwood instead of Vancouver's <laughs> hiking trails.
Well, we have had some pretty great weather lately mm -hmm. as long as we've been bundled up. So hopefully you've had the chance to get outdoors and take advantage of those blue skies. Maybe even take a hike on the Chief. It's mm -hmm. no walk in the park if you've done it. But you'd expect a professional athlete to take it in stride. You'd think, but that wasn't the case for a basketball player who recently released a vlog about his battle with the Chief. <laughs> You on your own. Oh, I look down again. Oh, I'm gonna throw up. How you feeling? Who, me? Man, I went hiking. I made it to the top. <laughs> Ain't worried about y'all. Y'all kiss my How about that? That's the NBA's Jimmy Butler. He's a four-time All-Star and has led the league in minutes played per game in recent years. Yet all that athleticism was no match for a hike in BC. I didn't think it was gonna be like that. I just thought, like, yo, it's gonna just be, like, a trail that's going up through the mountain. So I was okay, it can't be that bad. Little did I know that I was wrong. Oh my God. Oh, my legs, my legs are shaking. Oh, I can, I can barely go. Oh my God, I'm gonna start crying. Oh my mama. Okay, you got steps here, and then you got a flat trail, and then you gotta go from little rock to little rock to big rock to medium-sized rock, and then you gotta climb up on this thing, and it's just okay. It's a full-body workout. Just like so that happened last May, and before the trip, Butler and his team went shopping. Among the items he supposedly bought for the hike, a knife, a snake repellent, a $5,000 backpack, and rope in case they fell off a cliff. <laughs> the end, Butler says, you don't have to worry about me doing that again. Okay, so there's a first and a last time for everything. <laughs> <laughs> I watched the whole thing. It's, it's pretty funny. It is pretty, a little trip to Mech. The Mech visit was worth, uh, yeah. All yeah, that. not going to get his $5,000 backpack there, but uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can always find our news program, cbc.ca slash bc. Dan Bird is back in studio at 11 after the National. Have a good night. Good night.